In this video, what we'll discuss is how to determine if two graphs are isomorphic or not. Let's take a look at these two graphs as our first example. If we want to determine whether or not these are isomorphic, before we blindly go and try to find an isomorphism, there's a couple of basic checks that we can perform. The first check would be to see that they have the same number of vertices. Obviously, if you're trying to map the vertices of one graph to the vertices of the other, and you want to do this with a bijection, they need to have the same number of vertices. Next, you'll want to check if they have the same number of edges. That's because to be isomorphic, you need to also preserve adjacency and non-adjacency, so you must have the same number of edges. If you count up the edges in the first graph, you'll see it has 9. If you count up the edges in the second graph, you'll see it also has 9. Once those two conditions are satisfied, you'll start to want to look at structural similarities or differences. Now in this case, I can observe that the graph on the left has degree 3 at every vertex, so it's 3 regular. And similarly, the graph on the right is 3 regular. So that is a structural similarity. Now if you look at the graph on the left, you may notice that it looks similar to something you've seen before. If you color in the top vertices blue and then the bottom vertices red, you'll see that every edge in this graph goes between a blue vertex and a red vertex. In other words, this graph is bipartite. So if they're going to be isomorphic, the other graph will have to be bipartite as well. If we color in vertex A, C, and E as blue and vertices B, D, and F as red, we'll be able to observe that all of the edges in this graph on the right also go between a red vertex and a blue vertex. So indeed, it is also bipartite. So now we may be starting to believe that these two graphs are really essentially the same thing, and now it's time to look for an actual isomorphism. Let's call the graph on the left G and the graph on the right H. And now we'll define theta to be a map from the vertices of G to the vertices of H as follows. Theta will move the vertices from the graph G to the vertices of the graph H, where we write the vertices of the graph G on top. And now underneath, I'm going to write where each of those vertices maps to. And there are many ways to do this, but for example, I'm going to give one option. Now something very important to notice is that up here we have 1, 2, and 3, which were blue vertices, in other words, belonging to a partite set in the graph G. And down at the bottom we had C, E, and A, which were blue vertices belonging to a partite set. We also have 4, 5, and 6 belonging to a partite set which we had called red in the graph G, and B, D, and F belonging to the bottom red set, which was the partite set colored in red from graph H. Now it's very important that in this mapping we map a partite set to a partite set. So any partite set in G must go to a partite set in H, but the actual coloring was arbitrary. I could have colored A, C, and E in any color that I like, but the fact that they are a partite set is what's important. So in this example, I've mapped the partite set 1, 2, 3 to the partite set B, D, F. Equivalently, I could have matched the partite set 1, 2, 3 to the vertices A, A, C, and E. The reason why we have this choice here is because a partite set of any size must be mapped to a partite set of the same size. In this particular example, both of our partite sets have size 3, and that's why we have the choice where to map them to. In fact, just so that you can see another option, here let me write sigma to be another mapping from the vertices 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 of the graph G, and let's map 1, 2, 3 to A, C, and E, and we'll map 4, 5, and 6 to D, F, and B. What we'll do next is to show that our original mapping here, theta, is an isomorphism, but you could perform the exact same checks on this map sigma, and it's another option for an isomorphism. First, we observe that theta is onto since each vertex in H gets mapped to by something. Also, theta is one-to-one -one, since no two vertices of G will map to the same vertex of H. Therefore, we know that theta is indeed a bijection. Now we need to check that adjacency is preserved and non-adjacency is preserved. So I'll take as an example just one edge to demonstrate this. If I look at the edge 1, 4 in the graph G, I know that this is an edge, so I have 1, 4 in the edge set of G. Now I have to take a look at theta of 1, theta of 4, and determine if that is an edge in the new graph H. 
So theta of 1 is b and theta of 4 is c. And if you look up at the graph h, yes indeed, b and c are adjacent in the graph h. So that's excellent. Adjacency is preserved for this one edge. You'll need to do the same check for every edge in the graph g and show that it maps to an edge in h. Similarly, if you take any pair of non-adjacent vertices in the graph G, you'll find that they are not adjacent in the graph H. So after you've checked that all the edges are preserved, you'll know that G is indeed isomorphic to H using this particular isomorphism. Let's take a look at another example. Here we have a couple of larger graphs, and again we want to determine whether or not they are isomorphic. Let's start with the basic checks. First of all, the graph on the left has 8 vertices, and on the right, we also have 8 vertices. If you count up all the edges of the graph on the left, you'll find there are 12 of them, and similarly, if you count up the edges on the graph on the right, you'll get again 12 edges. Next, you might start to look at the degrees of all the vertices, and you'll see that the graph on the left is 3 regular, but so is the graph on the right. So at this point, you might be tempted to say, well, okay, I'm going to call the graph on the left G, and I'm going to call the graph on the right H, and I'm going to look for a nice isomorphism, which is a bijection that preserves all the adjacencies. But if you try to find such a bijection, you're going to end up running into problems. And the reason why you're going to run into problems is because it turns out that these two graphs are not isomorphic. Figuring out why two graphs are not isomorphic is a hard problem in general. What we're going to do is have to look for a structural property that one of the graphs has, which the other one doesn't. So something that it happens in graph G but does not happen in graph H, or vice versa, something that happens in graph H that does not happen in graph G. It's not necessarily obvious what the property is that you're going to be looking for. For example, here we checked the degrees and they worked out. You may also say something like, well, the graph H has an 8 cycle around the outside, but then you look at the graph G and you are able to find an 8 cycle if you take v1, v2, v3, v4, then v8, v7, v6, v5, and back to v1. So it also has an 8 cycle. So you have to be a little bit more clever about it, and what I'm going to do is to show you, for this example, what you can use as a structural property, and this will give you a feeling for how these can work in general. Let's start by exploring the graph G. If I select the vertex v1, and I just look at it, and I see that across the way there's a vertex v3, which is not adjacent to v1, and I put that into my set of vertices that I'm considering, these two blue ones, I can say, well, okay, these two are mutually not adjacent to each other. But I notice that I can continue to do this. I can put in vertex v8 into my set of blue vertices that I'm thinking about, and it's also not adjacent to v1 or to v3. And not only that, I can continue this process. I can add vertex v6, and now I have four vertices, none of which are adjacent to any of the others. So G has four mutually non-adjacent vertices. You may notice that you cannot make a set of five mutually non-adjacent vertices in the graph G because anytime you try to add on a fifth vertex, you will suddenly find that it is indeed adjacent to one of the vertices in your set. So this is an interesting property. We were able to find a set of four vertices inside of this graph which were mutually non-adjacent. Let's determine whether or not we can do that on the graph H. Let's say that I start by picking vertex V1 in H, and I look at what I could add to my potential set of mutually non-adjacent vertices. Well, I can't use vertices V2, V8, or V5 anymore because they are adjacent to V1. So now I look at the four remaining vertices which I might be able to choose from, and let's say that I choose vertex V3. It'll work out no matter what, depending on which vertex you use. You'll get the same answer. If I choose vertex V3, then I cannot use V4 or V7, and then I'm stuck with only V6. And this gives me just three vertices, V1, V3, and V6. So I have three mutually non-adjacent vertices, but not four. So again, if you had started with V1 and then chose V4 next, you would have ended up in the same position where you only get three. In other words, H does not have a set of four vertices that are mutually non-adjacent. And that is a structural property that G has that H does not have. And that's how we are able to conclude that indeed the two graphs are not isomorphic. Next, I will be posting a bonus video where I will show you how to test whether two graphs are isomorphic using a computer test run on Sage. 
If you don't know, Sage is a very useful free programming language based on Python that has many advanced features including a lot of graph theory functions, so make sure to check it out. If you've enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and subscribe for more updates. See you next time!